Answering the question of are we alone has turned out to be a bit more difficult than was originally envisioned when SETI first began decades ago. At first, it was a matter of looking for giant omnidirectional beacons blasting out high energy messages, much like what we saw in the movie Contact. But as we've gone through the process of searching, it's becoming evident that such a scenario was, in a way, wishful thinking. We have seen no such unambiguous beacons, and thinking on just why a civilization would expend massive amounts of energy on a signal has changed. It's very likely to be far more subtle than that, and that any intentional message would be beamed directly at us. But beacons aren't the only game in town. Since the advent of SETI, other technosignatures beyond radio have been thought of. Now we can look for laser emissions, industrial chemicals in the atmospheres of exoplanets, Dyson swarms, and a host of other signatures that would tell us if there are alien civilizations out there. When and if we ever do find them, it will then be a matter of envisioning what they are like, going on whatever facts we glean about them. My guest today specializes in just that, imagining alien civilizations. Welcome to Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's special episode, John is joined by longtime friend Isaac Arthur, host of Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. A physicist and futurist, Isaac explores the possibility and the future of humanity on his channel, and also speculative looks at what alien civilizations might be like, science fiction, and of course explorations into the possible solutions for the Fermi Paradox. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me. John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the event horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Isaac Arthur, welcome back to the program. John, thanks for having me on. Now, Isaac, what first brought the Fermi Paradox to your attention? How, how long have you been looking into it? I don't know when I first came, became aware of the term, probably in the early 2000s, but I mean, I kind of grew up watching all that sci-fi, Doctor Who, and Star Trek, and a lot of times it never seemed too realistic to me when it was dealing with a lot of the alien civilizations, and I guess that got me pondering it before I even knew what the term was, but I'd say probably the early 2000s when I first encountered the actual term, the concept, but... You know, it's it's just one of those ones that if you watch a lot of sci-fi, you just find yourself wondering, you know, why are these alien civilizations acting this way? Where are all these ones at in our world? If things were like they were in the show, where are all these guys at? So, yeah, I think it just kind of comes naturally to anyone thinking a lot about sci-fi or space and how big it is. Now, if you if you had to take a guess, a gut feeling, what do you think the solution to the Fermi Paradox is? is what is the most likely explanation for why we don't see anything when we look out into uh, space i think the i mean it's the fact that we see anything at all is is usually the biggest indicator to me that there aren't any big civilizations out there now for me that says that that either they almost never occur or something happens to them before they can actually get out there and expand and it's so hard for me to imagine a disaster that gets everybody um that it just seems like it's more likely at this stage that the pathway to intelligence just doesn't pop up much. Now, whether that's because Earth-like planets are really rare, or evolution doesn't tend to go to complexity much, or just brains and concepts and abstract thinking are uncommon, I don't know, but I, I tend to favor the idea that life itself is probably pretty common, but just doesn't go intelligence too often. I'm generally in agreement there. I think we live in a microbial universe where You'll probably run across lots of microbes and maybe some photosynthesizing plants and things like that. But they're, for me, the, the best option of a great filter is the, the leap between simple life and complex life. And that conspicuously took a very, very long time here on Earth. You know, life was, was prokaryotic for over almost two billion years. And then all of a sudden that, you know, something ingested something else and didn't digest it. And all of a sudden we have a, a leap. 
Do you think that that's a strong solution as well? Do you think that's the great filter? Or do you think there's an even more likely one than that? I'm hesitant to call that one a full-blown great filter, because that to me is always a, a great filter is the one that reduces the odds from basically almost every planet that could conceivably have life to, you know, to intelligence right there. Uh, but I do feel like that's going to be the major one, that you just don't see life getting very complex too often. And uh, again, for the same reason, you, you had very, very simple life here for a really long time. And uh, once it started going complex, it got really complex. And, uh, you know, land-based life is only 400 million years old, whereas life's been around here for almost 4 billion. I mean, when I showed the exact timeline. And uh, it just strikes me. I mean, there was a lot of complexity in the ocean before that, of course, too. But, uh, you know, there are so many little conditions on a planet that could prevent complex life occurring. You know, if you haven't got photosynthesis, you're probably never going to get the, uh, the density of life necessary for real diversity and, and food chains of, of complexity. And, uh, you know, those predator-prey cycles are going to be so important for intelligence. It's easy to say, well, you know, an algae could get intelligent, or a tree could get intelligent, and, and you could make an algae or a tree that were intelligent, but it's the predator-prey cycle that drives that. It's mobility. There's no advantage to having a brain unless it's being used to keep you alive in some fashion. And uh, if you're not mobile, that brain doesn't really help you do much or anything. Uh, whereas you're paying so much energy to keep it around that it should just by Darwin go away. But, you know, a planet that was very cloudy, for instance, because it had just a little bit more, you know, humidity than ours, might never actually have photosynthetic life, because it might have become, you know, worth it to use light as a source like that. Or one that had just a little bit more water than ours, as would well be the case if our gravity was a bit higher, we might retain more hydrogen, have more water, and then you never get land-based life. So there you might have complex life, but never gets to be land-based, never invents fire. And for that matter, we had fire for a million years before we really did much of anything besides cook and sharpen sticks with it. You know, ceramics is... 10,000 years old about, and that's metal even younger. That's a long time for humanity have existed without really doing much with technology. Oh, it's certainly true. It's conspicuous. And you, you have to ask a question, um, is technology a natural end result for a civilization, or if, is it simply the way it was, you know? And the most complex thing you do is painting, you know, paint pictures on cave walls. But I don't think it feels like that would be a great filter itself or the idea that you have intelligence and, I mean, fully abstracted intelligence like humans have. I could see a lot of civilizations sticking around a long time, not making much progress, same as we didn't, you know, really advance to pottery for so long after our brains already developed. But I can't see, you know, there are levels of filters, you know, a great filter being something that's like lottery odds, almost nobody ever does it. Whereas you might have filters that are like coin flip odds, and I, I'd have difficulty seeing that uh, anything with like all level of intelligence and social interaction, not going technology, less than one time out of ten, that would seem improbable to me. So, how likely do you think it is that, you know, of course the, the biggest of the great filters, or the most ominous anyway, is that civilizations invariably destroy themselves? Yeah, the late do you filters. Think that, do you think that's just a bit too pessimistic, or do you think it could very well be the case. It really is, in my opinion, very pessimistic. I, you've got some other scenarios for late filters. Um, I mean, the tradition you'd say that it's you can't colonize the galaxy because it's impractical or you destroy yourself. Because you can't see civilizations our size very far off, so they don't have to be all that uncommon to be hidden. But it's these galaxy-spanning ones you're going to see. I don't feel you can make a case anymore that interstellar colonization isn't going to be practical. It just seems like that that's not, you know, too many things potentially allow it, like laser highways, for instance, laser sails, you know. So then you have to come up with the reason why we destroyed ourselves or why we didn't colonize a galaxy but could have. And that either means you found something better, like uh, you could open up portals to other parallel Earths so you colonize those instead, or, uh, you know, uninhabited ones where Homo sapiens ever arose, or you kill yourself off. And you have to kill yourself off in a particularly thorough and non-replaced way. You know, if, if Skynet kills you off, then all you've got is, and that's not a Fermi Paradox answer, Skynet goes and colonizes the galaxy instead. That's like saying that, the, that Homo sapiens are the answer to Neanderthals as a Fermi Paradox, it doesn't work out. And then once you're in a planetary, how do you kill yourself off as a species? It, it would take a lot of work, and it would just seem improbable that that could be plausible, so. I don't want to discard the late filters, but uh, I, to me, they just don't work out very well. Now, what do you think about that? Do you think it's actually still feasible 
in modern day thinking within science and sci-fi to actually colonize an entire galaxy sort of Kardashev type 3 level civilization or do you think you we just stop at a certain point and where it's you know practical to maintain a civilization or a cohesive civilization of uh, humans do you think we we go full on all galaxy or do we just stay local I think we, you know, like individually, I, we might stay local. But uh, you, you think about people assume it has to be some kind of, you know, organized process. It really does not have to be. When we emerge from, I, I think, Ethiopia is usually where it's put these days, those tribes that had migrated to the Middle East were not asking whether or not they could migrate to India by going home and phoning the government of Ethiopia at that time. Each tribe just kind of split off and did its own thing and, and slowly wandered out. No civilization that should ever form with technology should ever be non-expansionist by nature. Now, they might change themselves later on, but if you've climbed your way up Darwin's ladder, you've done it with the ability to replace your numbers inside your natural environment. You have to have that kind of level of birth rate, and you have to have that kind of desire to spread outward. That that's just built by evolution. There's really no pathway to avoid that. You can change it later on, but the first thing technology does, the kind of the first point of technology, is to increase the number of surplus people you have because nature is not killing them off as well. You know, you increase your food stores so less people die in the winter, you uh, make it easier for older people to live longer or productively, you have less babies dying, that kind of thing. So you have a population surplus and a tendency to grow. Every culture that descends out of that should tend to have the same mindset. If we can comfortably grow, you know, the, the, the overpopulation is, is not a new concern. It's been a constant of humanity's existence. I had long before there was humanity. And we've always had ways of dealing with that. But then every time we had access to brand new photo places to be, you know, we've expanded. Every time we found a new way to enhance our carrying capacity for, you know, how we farm or whatever it is, we've expanded. If you can comfortably expand, someone's going to think that's a good idea. And unless you're willing to actually shoot them to keep them from expanding, then they're going to do that. So if you can make an interstellar spaceship that can actually go colonize a place and set up a colony there, then someone is eventually going to do it again. And again, and again, and you know, it doesn't have to be organized, and the timelines for human generations are just so tiny compared to galactic timelines that you're going to be filling up as you go, very quickly. That, that's, that's an interesting thought, colonization. Now, we have two opposing views on that right now with our current two billionaires going into space. Elon Musk says colonize planets and make use of a planet like Mars. Mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos? completely opposite he says we need o'neill cylinders and make that our habitat which do you think is more realistic do you think it's better to have just a, a perfect environment within an o'neill cylinder or do you think we should have planetary environments at least as well i, I, I you know it's a false dichotomy to me it's you do what people want to do with it at the time you can do a lot more with a lot less in terms of raw materials when you're building habitats like O'Neill cylinders because you only need a few meters or maybe a kilometer if you want to be really, you know, Earth-like of dirt. Whereas we got several thousand kilometers of, of dirt and rock and more magma underneath us. And you can make an awful lot more layers. You can turn a planet into a million times the living area with an O'Neill cylinders being made out of it. So that's always going to be your, you know, more economic approach. Although even that's arguable, because somebody might say, well, why even bother with gravity? Why not do some kind of cybernetic enhancement or genetic enhancement that makes you not need gravity or go the digital route? So either one of those might turn out to be the wrong one. You know, we'd say, where are you going to colonize first, to Mars or the moon, or are you going to build an O'Neill cylinder? Pretty good odds are the first worlds we'll actually colonize will be right here on Earth. They might be virtual worlds. You know, uh, you, you build... Shared realities, very extreme versions of MMORPGs that people spend a lot of time in. And if you can do that, you can also make sure they can pretty much get their work done there too. So it could be that the first wars we colonize are right here on Earth. And in that sense, if you're creating virtual environments, you know, virtual worlds, nothing stops you from having virtual aliens. No. And interacting with them. It's, it's, you know, you can go colonize a ward where you could genetically engineer yourself some flying dragons, or you could go make a virtual ward where they're just as realistic, you know? <laughs> and if, 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 if we take for a moment as a granted that you can simulate a human mind to the point that it's, it's just a human, it just happens to be on a computer, which many people disagree about, then that's going to be an even more efficient option than things like rotating habitats, because you can build a lot more computer chips out of the same amount of raw materials you can habitats, which is way more than planets. But the critical thing is, some people aren't going to want to live in O'Neill, so they're going to want to live on a planet. 
and other folks are not going to want to live in a digital environment. They're going to want to live in a uh, or, or a planet, or you know, live in space as a cyber, you know, cybernetically or genetically enhanced or mo mo you know, modified person. The biggest thing about the idea is that you're not going to ever have humanity colonize the galaxy. You're just going to have a whole bunch of different branches that have broken off. They might all call themselves human or not, right? They're not going to look the least bit alike after they've been gone for a while from this uh, from this region of space. And so it's kind of like saying that, I, I don't know what the precursor animal was for humans and dinosaurs, but it'd be like saying they colonized space in some ways. Although there would be a faster timeline, but then again, you've got genetic enhancement and cybernetics that might speed up things like evolution quite a lot. What would you pick? If you could live on Mars, Earth, or an O'Neill cylinder, what, where would you go? Earth. <laughs> I, I have to I have to say, I tend to agree, I'm not leaving, but... yeah. For somebody that talks about colonizing Mars and everything else, I'm going to be the last person that actually goes and does it. Oh yeah. I'd be willing to go visit places like that, probably, but uh, I might say, well, if you don't want to leave, you know, then then why would you assume everybody else is? And so I'm not assuming everybody else is. Um, you know, the United States was not colonized by the majority of people living in other, you know, in Afro-Eurasia, right? Some people decide they want to go out. You have things like life extension going on and, and or, you know, growing birth rates and things like that. They're, you're always going to have folks who want to go to, you know, be a big fish in a smaller pond or just go pioneer. That's a, that's actually built into us by evolution. Go find new territory, new turf. And that should be built into everybody else, too, which is part of the problem with the Fermi Paradox. It's hard to come up with an evolutionary pathway that isn't going to produce a uh, technological civilization that isn't expansionist, exploratory, curious, and social. It might be many different degrees of this compared to humans. They might be much more aggressive and much less aggressive. They might be slower growth than we are or faster growth than we are. I mean, compared to most mammals, we breed very slowly. And they might be any number of differences with us, but they're going to be curious. They're going to want to explore and expand, and they are going to be chatty, you know, because specialization is how you go get technology. Your brain is not going to be enough to you. You don't evolve a brain big enough to invent all the technology by yourself. You could, eventually, maybe something that had been trapped under water or, you know, something that has access to fire for the first time might be, have evolved such a huge brain they could do all that technology themselves. But rather, when you first get just enough technology, just enough, you know, brain power to start having basic technology, you get specialization. So that person X masters this, person Y masters that, because it takes a whole lifetime to excel at it to the best. And that pathway only really works for your socialization. Yeah, they have to be willing to work with each other. They, you know, as a group. Now that's that's it. well, but essentially that's what we do nowadays. My big concern about the future is you, we touched on it was virtual reality because that seems to me to be a way to build a, a civilization of lotus eaters, where you have just too many people that are wishing to spend as much time as they can in virtual reality. Do you see this as a problem, or do you think it'll just be like? how video games are today. Some people will spend too much time doing it, but most people won't. Uh, yes, yes, and no, I guess. <laughs> it could be a problem. Uh, I think a lot of people would give into it as uh, kind of a constant, and I don't even want to say put a bad stereotype as saying they're giving into it. it. So long as they are doing whatever's necessary to keep the civilization going, if they want to spend all their time staring at the naval and robots are handling it, that's fine too. But the reason why it's not a good for me paradox answer is because if I want to simulate something as simple as a person I'm, I'm willing to spend time talking to in a virtual reality, you know, it's a, I, I, I go stop in Westeros and I want to go talk to the guys on the wall, um, those people need to be believable to me. They need to be more interesting to me than, uh, than regular life is. Otherwise, I'm not going to get you know, hooked into it. Some people might, but the majority would not. It has to be very realistic. It has to be basically able to mimic being a human pretty well. And then you compare that to what's necessary to build a robot that is able to take an asteroid apart and turn it into uh, devices, you know, or simple manufacturing. That, uh, that simulated person in that reality is way, way more complicated than that robot is. Way more complicated. So before you can actually ever get the technology to do really good virtual simulations that would be addicted for most people, uh, I mean in a sense of more than video games or TV is now, you already have the technology to colonize the galaxy. And you, you know, you're going to have some people who want to do that, but it doesn't matter if they do or not, because colonize is a very ambiguous term. You know, it's not a space opera. You don't go settle planet after planet. 
what you're doing is mining them and accessing them for resources. And if what your resources are life support chambers for bodies and, and computer chips, then you strip mine the entire galaxy and bring it home. And uh, you can do that. You, know, you can stuff all that into a relatively small area. And you have all the technology for it. So even though you're not colonizing the galaxy, you're still breaking the Fermi Paradox because a galaxy that somebody has gone and mined out, all the way down to star lifting stuff, does not look the same as what we absorb. So if somebody had been out doing that, if they had gone virtual like that, even if they took no steps to uh, prevent their society from falling apart on some kind of internal navel gazing, their galaxy they're in is still going to be exploited for resources because they had the technology to do that first. Even if it was just by a couple of minutes, and, and you know it's going to take a lot longer to go from simple robot to you know enthralling simulation. The other aspect of that is if you have the technology to you know fake worlds that people want to live in, you have the technology to fake parents that you can raise kids with. So those people can still be having kids or growing them in tanks and having them raised by virtual reality simulations, and they can raise them in a way that is going to be fairly resistant to going into that utopia navel gazing. Uh, even if it's only temporary, so they could set them up so your first 20 years you're not really allowed to play in the simulation all that much and you're not allowed to enjoy it to the same degree of analysis, you have to do productive work of maintaining the civilization, right? <laughs> you know? And then you're allowed to do the utopia, you know, that, that these are options people would think of if this is starting to get to be a real problem, and I'm sure other species would think of them too, other aliens, so it just doesn't work out. You know, the, the virtual reality thing doesn't make sense as a way to stop you from n not necessarily classically colonizing the galaxy, but to answering the Fermi Paradox, because the Fermi Paradox is looking for evidence of intelligence, not colonized planets. You know, the, I mean, the Karlshev 3 concept isn't even about detecting planets, it's about detecting entire englobed galaxies. It's just not a good answer in that context. And we have to take a break. When we come back, we'll talk more about the Fermi Paradox and the Great Filters and also the far future. We'll be back in a moment. Ah, coffee time. Do you think anyone realizes we only take these breaks so we can enjoy a good cup of joe? Last week, someone said I sold out the big coffee. Have you? Sadly, no. Ooh, it's ready. Anna, what is this? It's tea, John. Green tea. Where is the coffee? I've detected that you're slightly dehydrated, John. The tea is better for you, and it's better than coffee. You're on a health week. Wait, did you put tea in mine too? Of course not, Isaac. Your coffee is freshly ground, black, and in your science and futurism with Isaac Arthur mug. Well, thank you, Anna. Ah, oh, that's the stuff. You have your own coffee mug. Yes. Would you like one? What I'd like is my coffee. <laughs> and we're back. Now, Isaac, one thing about this, uh, the solutions to the Fermi Paradox, is that we, we may not know what we're looking for, really, leading to a discussion of techno-signatures. And do you think it simply could be that we just don't have the technology or the precision of technology to spot alien techno signatures yet? Or do you think we would just have seen them by now or haven't we looked enough? Uh, what's your general sense of that? Um, you know, the biggest techno signature you'd have from a civilization that was really out there doing stuff is that you never invent astronomy because you wouldn't be able to see any stars with your eyes. Everything we can look at that a civilization would want to do, that, that's still bound by the laws of physics as we know it. And of course, if those go out the window, you know, if they got entropy breaking stuff, the game changes. But they are bound by known physics. Um, they're going to want to play with mass and energy as much as they can, because that's what they run everything on, ultimately. And stars are the biggest source of those that we have readily collected, and so they're going to do something with them. And that something is either going to be tapping them for energy or just using them as a nice gravitational place to build around and slowly harvest for fusion fuel or taking them apart and feed them into a black hole. And, you know, that's going to result in that infrared heat signature going off them from the waste heat. But even if they don't use stars for that, even if for some reason they're not really using stars for their mass and energy, which is kind of hard to think about why they wouldn't, you know, if they're not feeding them in the black holes or taking them apart, 
they're still going to want to cluster together into what looks like a Dyson Sphere because you want to be as close as you can to everybody else if you, unless you have something like instantaneous transport. Even if you've got fashion light stuff it has to be instantaneous otherwise you got a lag time on signals and travel. And so you cluster as close together as you can. Not not everyone would, you have some folks who would want off the side, but the majority of their civilization is going to want to cluster together. And the limitation on how close they can cluster is is how much heat they can get rid of in that area. And that's, you know, a Dyson Sphere is already that maximum. It, the size might change, but you're still going to have that big infrared sphere. And that's your ultimate techno signature, they're basically their garbage, <laughs> which is you know, often very handy in archaeology. So anything though they're going to do is complex as you're going to see it. You know, civilizations don't really have much reason to hide from less advanced civilizations. And they can't hide from more advanced civilizations, if, you, if it's a threat thing, right? It, everyone saw you before you developed your technology to hide. They knew you were there. And uh, except for the folks who weren't around yet, who you're not afraid of because you've got you know, millennia of advancement over top of them. So they have no real reason to hide and anything they're doing, I mean civilization is just not something you hide. When you're going big like that you see that stuff around, nobody tries to hide all cities here, you know? There's a million different ways you can detect New York City without seeing it with your own eyeball. And uh, you certainly can see it with your own eyeball because we don't try to hide it, we put billboards and signs up pointing towards it. So when we talk about trying to find a techno central or what it might not be what we expect it to be, it might not be what we expect it to be, but it almost seems like it's inevitable that it would be something really visible. Well there's also the, the complicating problem that it may not also be where we think it is because we tend to look at sun-like stars and you know exoplanets and things like that, but an advanced civilization may instead prefer to exist near a black hole. And I don't know if anyone has ever checked black holes for technosignatures or if there would be, even be a technosignature that you could detect of a civilization. No, I mean there's been no real, and one of the reasons why you go around and say a galactic core black hole, which is a popular one, is because you know, you, you're clustering real tight around something like that because it's a great power source. You dump matter down and it does better than fusion and Star Wars does in terms of energy efficiency. And that is one you could potentially miss because if it was just a normal galaxy that clustered around the center of that galaxy, uh, that's a lot of light and infrared and stuff in the way and it's a very concentrated little dot where you'd expect it to be a concentrated dot of, of energy. You have to look pretty precisely to spot that little, you know, very bright but still relatively little infrared wave. On the other hand though, if you collapse an entire galaxy into something, into some kind of mega structure around the center of a galaxy, uh, what we call a Bosch planet, it's not that that's hidden, it's just that it's really quite small and your odds of statistically just happening to look at that random spot, because it's not in the galaxy anymore that's visible, it's just a point in space. And a relatively small point in space that's very very far away, you know you might be looking for one that's a billion light years away and has only a light year across. And so we could miss something like that. But the problem is that it's not that you're missing where they live, it's that you can see other stuff and they should live everywhere. You know, you, you, there's no reason for them to ever stop advancing. Nor would you ever expect them to be a cohesive civilization. You know, some of them might decide to cluster around that and that might be where the big empires are that one spot, but what about all the folks who don't want to be part of that and want to go off and do their own thing? And what about the civilizations that just didn't go that specific route? The the big problem that we always come back to with techno angels of finding them is, is that it's not that you can't see what they've built, it's that you can see stuff that they haven't touched. And you know, you try to look at this planet right now, we don't have places we haven't touched, not very many and there's a reason why we haven't touched them yet and we'll get around to that. You know, you look at the Earth uh, a thousand years ago, it looked less touched. And we're not talking about some brand new civilization here, we're talking about one that's bound for millions or billions of years at this point. And you know, they should have gotten their fingers onto everything nearby them, in some fashion. Some people have advanced that certain phenomena that we see in nature, and one example would be the fast radio bursts, some of them, some of them, um, might actually be mistaken and might in fact be of alien origin. Do you think that there's any chance of that or do you think that this is a completely astrophysical phenomenon? I'm pretty sure it's an astrophysical phenomenon. You know, I, I, until you know what it is, you can never be sure, but it's, it's kind of like we had it going on with Tabby Star, for instance. You don't know that it's not artificial, but and it's not that, that should be the last thing you think about. It was the first thing we all thought about when we first heard about that is could that be a Dyson, you know, but you know, you've got to be kind of careful when you're speaking about stuff like that. If there is a natural explanation, that's the first one to go to. 
Not just because you, you know want aliens to exist. It'd be cool if they did. Rather because odds are anything that's a sign of artificial life is going to be so obviously artificial that it's not going to be a discussion for more than a day before it's like, yep, that's that's it. You know, you see a random phenomenon and say, well, maybe that could be artificial. And say, okay, well, we're not, right? You see a sign of human civilization, it, it's not like we have to debate whether or not that's that's random. Is this candy bar wrapper of a natural phenomena, or is it manufactured? Not not really something you argue about much, you know? And, I mean, the fast radio bursts, we still don't know what they are, but they don't seem to match up the profile we expect for a beacon. And that's really the only reason I can think of why you'd emit something like that as, as a beacon. And it, it doesn't match up to what you expect it to be. It's kind of the same problem we have with uh, Mua Mua. If it were a spaceship, it only makes sense a spaceship or a space probe if it was a broken one. And since the whole idea is that we're trying to detect something that's artificial and a probe, it being broken is, you know, because it meets the template of being broken isn't really the best logic to base that off of, you know? That's one of the big problems with doing any of this is that the ambiguity of some of the stuff that I talk about on my original channel and here, the ambiguity of it is so high that you can't really... You can't point to that and say, that's an alien civilization. Still, there are some weird ones, you know? Oh yeah, tons of weird phenomena, and, and they could be artificial. It's it's not that I don't want them to be artificial. I mean, obviously, in theory, I shouldn't have an opinion one way or another, but I'd, I'd love for them to turn out to be artificial, to be honest, because I, I don't figure they're hostile towards us. But it's just more the feeling that if it's ambiguous, it's probably natural, because if it's not natural, it's probably not ambiguous. And, you know, it, it's... One thing, when you like only have a trace note of something in passing, you can't be sure if that rock is an arrowhead or not. But you're not going to walk through uh, an abandoned town here in the United States, some little ghost town, even one that's been half buried for centuries, and say, I think this might be natural. It's my feeling that what is artificial, you know, intelligence recognizes intelligence. If it's artificial, it's going to look artificial. If it's an artificial signal, it's going to look artificial. And, I mean, that's debatable in some cases, you know, you got, uh, you know, encrypted or compressed signals, you wouldn't be able to, you know, say, well, we can't see if that's noise or not, and say, well, yeah, no, you probably do use compressed and encrypted signals a lot in space. The problem isn't that you can read what their radio signals are on that planet and say, well, I can see what this says, so it's artificial, it's that there's no reason that planet should be emitting that much of that signal. And you don't need to be able to read someone's email to know that they got an email. You know, if there's no natural source for that much radio transmission, then it's probably artificial. But that's the problem, is we do have an idea what might cause fast radio bursts, and they only meet one profile. You can't look and say, this one might be artificial, and say, well, if this was artificial, what is it? They say, well, it might be X. Okay, if it is X, what other characteristics might it have? And you say, I'd expect to have X, Y, Z, or, or G, or whatever. And it doesn't come up with any of those. And so, I mean, that's not falsified yet, but that, that you know, definitely points against it. You say, if I'm building a space probe and I'd expect to have these qualities and it has one of those, but that one could be natural, there's a problem because you should expect to have more than one of those. You know, you expect to have quite a few of those and we're not seeing them coupled together. And that's the, you know, whenever we come across one of these phenomena, the first thing to ask is what would produce this effect? what could produce this effect, and if it's one of these five or six things that it might potentially be, what other effects should we see nearby? It seems like almost every time this comes up, it doesn't really hit. And then, of course, the other problem is, what long-term effects would it produce? Say, this might be a Dyson sphere. Say, okay, good. Where are the other Dyson spheres near it? And uh, this natural phenomena that we found nearby, where are they in the rest of the universe? And if we look further out, do we see more of them? And say, if we see more of them further out, are we seeing, you know, if it's artificial, uh, uh, we should expect to see more of them as the universe ages. So the further out you look, the less time that's elapsed, there should be less of these things. Whereas like a quasar, we, we see more quasars in the past. You know, there's no increase in density as we approach near time. If we were looking out and we saw a phenomenon in a lot of galaxies that they had less of them in the past, that would be a good sign of artificialness. But that's still say, well, is there anything explicitly artificial about this? Because otherwise, you might say it's a natural phenomenon. We have a lot of galaxies that are hitting the, uh, this is more common near us than far away, e.g. near in time, and they have some other characteristic of artificiality to them. That's when you start saying that might be a techno signature. And I think, I think there are two outstanding examples of this. 
unfortunately both are problematic. The first one that looked artificial was the wow signal. It was a narrow band signal at the hydrogen line and that's a problem for nature on both counts. So that one looked like it, but it never repeated. What's your feelings on that? Do you think that was probably more likely to be a glitch, or do you think that might have been something? I mean, I've seen the list of, of various possible scenarios, and one thing I try to avoid doing on these is, is they say, uh, well, what natural phenomena could it have been? And I say, well, I don't know what natural phenomena is, and since I don't, I, I don't want to say what it could have been besides that. There's a lot of things it could have been. Until you have evidence of what it is, a natural phenomena of what type, you're not really helping by, by uh, saying it was X rather than artificial. But no, I don't think the wow signal indicated too much. And, and, and then counterindicated by the fact that it did only happen one time. And say like, that's a great example to use of how we'd say, what else would we expect? What indicates a signal only happening once in, in a plausible Fermi paradox scenario? And say, well, that one there, that's zoo hypothesis. Somebody is, you know, keeping us from seeing the rest of the civilizations around us, and somebody snuck through the prime directive, as it were, and got a signal to us. So it only happened once, right? And now you're saying, in that context, you're saying this only makes sense if it was a zoo hypothesis a scenario. Somebody broke the rules, right? Now you know what the motivation is, and now you should say, what other things would we expect to see or not see based on that motivation? And you get a problem. You're not hiding your entire civilization in the natural universe. If you got a zoo hypothesis scenario, the most sane way to go about that is to not change your entire galactic empire to look different so it's hidden, is to hide the people you're trying to hide from. You encapsulate their, their solar system in, in a artificial net as it were, something that's you know not showing them the real galaxy outside. And that's got a problem not because why would you make a artificial universe that's so big? You know? <laughs> that, that that's so much extra stuff you have to hide and conceal and, and worry about not getting screwed up. If we found out the universe looked like it was only uh, a million miles across a few centuries back, we wouldn't be sitting around wondering about uh, other civilizations. And if your goal is to hide yourself from us, you don't want to be leaving evidence like a gigantic you know, fake universe around you. So that would be an example of how the WoW Angel, by indicating a zoo hypothesis scenario, a prime directive where they don't like to intervene or let us be seen, doesn't fit with the natural universe around us. The same for something like a simulation. You never want to make your lies or bigger than it has to be, and uh, you never want to make a, the lie that actually inc encourages people to look into it. But right? and the apparent universe around us, which would presumably be fake in a zoo hypothesis scenario, doesn't correspond to somebody who's trying to hide them. You know, hide you so you don't see or detect them because they should make it a lot smaller and simpler. And we have to take another break. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. And also check out Isaac's channel, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. And we're back with Isaac Arthur. So Isaac, we're, people are looking for techno signatures. We have a fairly robust um, SETI infrastructure with several different groups looking. If you had a guess, do you think it's going to be radio or do you think it would be something, some other techno signature that shows us an alien civilization if if we actually find one what sector do you think it's going to come from well it's kind of tricky on that one is you have to say when you ever you're trying to guess about these things you just say if we haven't already seen it uh why haven't they done it yet and and what would they do be doing instead and you know does that factor in the kind of the probability of that being seen we haven't seen any radio signals yet so i, I really don't think we'd be too likely to if folks are trying to communicate with us that way we should already pick that up and I can't imagine why suddenly the universe would change in the next 30, 40 years that people suddenly said, hey, let's talk. Right? Uh, but um, we might pick up a video signatures around planets, and, and it might be kind of ambiguous because, again, it might be encrypted and compressed. In fact, it almost certainly will be if it's uh, being broadcast a lot that we could actually see it and read it. But at the same time, I don't expect us to see radio signatures. I, I don't expect to see any signatures, to be honest. Uh, but when I, I think when we first see one of these, it's going to be so far away that the first one we see is going to be a K3 style one where it's going to be the uh, Dysonian SETI type thing only at the galactic scale where you see that waste heat across an entire galaxy um, but if we saw one in the near future I mean an actual radio signal I would expect it to come in English uh, possibly other languages too but I expect it to come in English and uh, inform you that they a you know delegation was arriving soon so you would expect it if we get it through radio it's going to be close yep then I'd expect it to be on a, on a 
broadcast method we already use and uh, might be a little bit you know antiquated version and i would expect it to be in in one of the languages that we first broadcast in which would get mostly english and a few other major languages this brings up um bracewell and von neumann probes because that would give a, a situation where it might be out there monitoring and then at some point when it thinks it's time they can uh, just simply turn on and say hello in our language and mm -hmm. do all kinds of crazy things because if it's been here for m millions of years it may have photographed dinosaurs and basically give us a reconstructed past history observational history of earth but do you think that's actually feasible this idea of a von neumann probe do oh sure um, I mean, when you get around to it, a, bi uh, a von Neumann probe is is nothing different than a basic biological organism that just happens to have been engineered right? and presumably is made out of metal as opposed to, you know, carbon and water. Um, it's a good approach for colonizing a galaxy on the surface of things, but in practice, you'd probably want to either sense, you have a choice when you're dealing with these things. Have you embraced AI or not? And if you haven't embraced AI because you've decided it's too dangerous, then you go with the stupidest probes you possibly can. Because you don't want them getting smart and coming home for a visit. Um, <clears throat> and if you have kind of embraced AI, you feel safe using it, then you send the smartest probe you possibly can. And if you're sending out the dumb kind, uh, it needs to have some kind of mechanism where it's not going to touch planets that you know you, that have life on them. Um, otherwise, that's an act of war. Whether or not you happen to think that's that's um, ethical or not, for the, the aliens might have no problem with exterminating new species. Uh, ethically, but they won't want to do it because they don't know what they're going to run into. They know they exist, and they're contemplating that they might bump into something else. And they bump into something else. It might be something older, nastier, or more altruistic than they are. And uh, you know, they don't want to send out your own colonization fleets and get an armada coming by to say, uh, "Hey, you know, you just killed off an entire civilization," you know, <laughs> and we've come back to return the favor. Um, so your baseball probe, your finally probe, is either going to be really simplistic. Uh, or it's going to be very advanced. And in this context, very advanced means at least human-level intelligence. And in that case, it's just going to make its presence known in the way that it decides is going to least shock us. It's going to study us. It knows way more about us than we do. And in most forced contact scenarios, it's either going to be, you know, you're not going to bump into each other on accident. That's possible, but very improbable. The idea of just two spaceships wandering into each other, very unlikely. Um, either you're coming across a civilization less advanced than you, in which case you're going to take the time to learn everything about them before you say hi, or they're coming across you flipped around, they're going to have learned about you first, or you're looking at something that's dead or something that's so far away that you're basically just picking up their existence by their waste energy and random noise, uh, or beacons that they've put out to say hello. So, you know, those very far distant ones, there might be an ignorance factor, but if I want to communicate with civilizations very far away from me that I don't know and can't realistically talk to any kind of sane timeline, I'm going to be saying them the Rosetta Stone over and over again in the most unambiguous way possible if my goal is to say hello. If not, I'm going to pick them up by their waist heat. Now, the thing about the, speaking about von Neumann probe, is that there are a number of terrifying scenarios where such an idea could, could go horribly wrong to the point that it might be banned in the Milky Way. If you send out a von Neumann probe, that's when you see the alien civilization because they destroy your probe so that it doesn't go and turn the entire galaxy into paperclips, the, the mm -hmm. infamous yep. paperclip maker. But there's another problem with it too, malicious von Neumann probes. Because if you're sending something out that's um, autonomous and electronic, it's gonna get hit by cosmic rays and it's gonna be subject to data corruption. But mm -hmm. every so often that data corruption might be a good thing and that evolution of sorts might be able to occur. Now, a lot of people are going to say, oh, that'll never happen, but it did happen with the one example of von Neumann machines that we have, which is life sure. on Earth. Do you think insane von Neumann probes wandering the galaxy, doing whatever they want to do, is a possibility? No, and for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's very right to point out that, you know, Grey Goo is one of those few doomsday scenarios that, that could hit us and not replace us. I said, if, if you just get killed off by Skynet, you haven't solved the Fermi Paradox because now there's just Skynet, same as Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, or Homo erectus, and so forth. Um, the problem with Grey Goo, of course, is it's stupid. But then again, so was the green goo that got the planet in the first place, uh, or the stuff that replaced it during the oxygen holocaust. They were stupid too, they're not anymore. Grey goo could mutate if it's accidental. 
the thing is about an engineered probe when you mess around with this stuff, you're going to think about mutation. We do not uh, randomly evolve our machines, we build them. You can create processes that are so unlikely to produce a mutation, even under radiation, that the odds of it happening even once in the entire course of the universe is basically zero. You know, so having two things that just randomly cross-connect, exchange data on how to do a template, you might say, these probes can only replicate if they lock in place with 20 other probes, compare data, and 19 out of 20 of them get the exact same data for any given stream. And if it's less than, say, 17 out of 20, they all just self-destruct or similar, right? And you've got things like check some things. We have ways that we check data and prevent corruption nowadays. And so that's kind of how you prevent that happening on accident uh, in terms of mutation as they are flying out there to colonize things. So that is a doable option. You know, you can't stop mutation occurring, but you can stop mutation from uh, spreading as it were. Um, on the other hand, uh, you don't have to worry so much about maybe people saying these things out and getting destroyed by enemy fleets because you'd probably shoot on them yourself. You know, if somebody says they're going to send a probe out, you're probably going to shoot it down before it leaves because they're putting you at potential risk. Not just from, you know, what if this probe of theirs shows up on an alien's doorstep and pisses them off, but because they've sent out a massive colonization fleet um, as a war by doing that, and that's shutting the entire rest of the galaxy off from you. In, possibly from them too because it's that much recklessly deployed um, and you can always kill anybody else's probes even if you're not using them yourself because they have to decelerate I can send a probe out that can accelerate way faster and be way smaller uh, than a, a, uh, a man made ship would be but it still has the max, same maximum speed if it wants to decelerate it has, it's using the same power drive it has to spend a lot of its fuel to slow down uh, you know because a probe that a probe can't crash into a planet at a tenth the speed of light and then start replicating it would be destroyed it, I don't care what you make it out of so they send that thing out there it has a slow down when it reaches its destination to start spawning you on the other hand can send a probe out behind it that can burn all of its fuel just to catch up to the thing and hit it and all it has to do is give it a love tap and it's destroyed and it doesn't have to be as big as their probe and it doesn't have to be as sophisticated as their probe because all its job is to chase after that thing and hit it you know um and that's kind of one of the ways you can prevent one of those space races. The other thing is, uh, unless you have a really unified solar system that's you know doing this civilization that's uh, completely unifies or which is, in my opinion, probably not too likely. Um, no one's going to let you play around with uh, you know secretly manufacturing vast amounts of nanotechnology and self-replicating machines uh, without oversight, because that effectively is an act of war. And yeah, they can go colonize the galaxy, but the people who did the colonizing are probably going to get themselves nuked back home. Uh, nobody wants you playing out that technology that close to home because all these things are effectively weapons. You know, if you have a spaceship, it's a weapon. And they don't know if you're building base sh spaceships to colonize the galaxy or missiles to hit their planet because they are the same thing. So if they see you doing that, uh, or they see you trying to be, you know, manufacturing secret and there is no stealth in space, they're going to demand oversight. And once you start getting that going on, people will say, well, how does this probe deal with, uh, you know, bumping into an intelligent alien race? And they say, oh, well, we don't have that modeled out. We don't have that, you know, sufficient to be controlled. We don't know for sure how it works. You know, we only have a basic plan. They're not going to let you launch that because that thing could come back to bite you. Um, you know, it comes across some alien race eventually that's going to take that personally, you know? <laughs> And that's just not something you want to do to get a, a slight head start on colonization when no one's going to let you keep that head start anyway. Now, we're getting into something that's, that's, that's interesting, galactic doomsday scenarios. So could a solution to the Fermi Paradox simply be that civilizations don't interact with each other because they conclude that it's always going to end up in conflict? So they just simply say, don't talk to the aliens. Is that viable? Because one can envision that if someone sends out von Neumann probes and it's, it's you know, they, the other civilization concludes that this is a weapon, then that civilization could do things like conceivably build a Dyson, a nickel Dyson beam, and mm -hmm. it just completely emaciate the galaxy with this giant mm -hmm. Death Star, which is way bigger than Star Wars' Death Star, and way more powerful, and, um, you know, fairly straightforward to build if you can figure out how to engineer it. So... Yeah. Wouldn't you think that maybe maybe everybody just avoids the great galactic arms race by just not talking to each other? Viable or not? 
Uh, sounds viable on the surface, but then there's always that issue. The, you know, unless you're actually willing to shoot down your own colony ships, which I don't think many people would, or shoot down your own trade ships, or you know, it's a high tech culture. It's it, it it respects curiosity. It pretty much has to. Um, it's every all these guys are gonna have anthropology departments. All of them are gonna have history departments, and they're gonna want to ch- you know talk to each other. Now you might say here's a buffer zone. We we do not colonize within a hundred light years of any planet that's got you know more than algae on it. Period. Right. And we do not colonize within one hundred light years of any of our own colonies. You're gonna have people who break that rule to some degree, and you're gonna have to have some method of dealing with that that doesn't involve blowing that planet up with the people on it uh you don't want somebody sending huge fleets in to go deal with the problem you know so you got to please up your own um and all that kind of points to having a diplomatic structure in place and again these are all have going to be evolved from cultures that have diplomacy because they are all going to be social cultures they might be much more uh antagonistic than us or much less antagonistic than us but they're going to be used to talking about problems and arbitrating and because uh, they have evolved kind of that same pathway we did and um, I just don't see a, a way that they'd say no communication at all now I don't think most alien civilizations would really want to chat with each other too much proportionally you know, you're not going to go on vacations or go shake their hands there but they are academics who study that they're going to be whole universities devoted to an, you know, an alien civilization that exists if we find one you know, they're going to be busy with that. They're going to want to talk to them and, and get questions and vice versa. So there will be an exchange of information. Right? Um, and then they start to talk to all their dotto colonies. And I don't see anybody, I, I just can't see life being so common that no one's going to colonize any other star systems. So there has to be, a, in a case like that, a thing that says, this space is yours, do with it as you please. Because from a realistic standpoint, that's going to happen anyway. How do you negotiate multi-thousand-year-long treaties? Because that's how long they have to last just to get them signed. Um, there has to be a very solid logic to why you're doing each individual rule. And there's not a lot of logic to saying stick to your own planet and only your own planet or your own solar system, period. Because there are going to be stars near value that nothing could ever realistically evolve on in the first place, like a supergiant. I got a supergiant next to me. I have to do something about it. It's going to blow up otherwise. They say, well, we're going to go colonize that and stall if that. No one, nothing's evolving around there. We have no choice but to do something with it anyway, and now it's ours. We had to invest all that energy to take anything apart or moving it. It's ours. Um, who's likely to create a treaty that bans that? It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So you just expect them to want to use their own space up, and um, big buffer zones are plausible, but I can't imagine anybody having buffer zones that were bigger than their own total territory or their envisioned total territory. So if you got a, you know a million species in the galaxy... Uh, current or upcoming, as you know, but you look at these places and say, well, they might have life within 50 million years in space, whatever. You've got a million of those, then that's a hundred billion stars, and that's that's uh, you know, a hundred thousand a piece. And then I can't see them seeing, well, you only get 10 of those of those hundred thousand. They'd be more like, well, no, you got a buffer space of like 10 percent around you, so you should have some civilizations on the other side who took their you know, 100,000 solar systems and colonized the 90 percent of them they were allowed to. Um, and so it just doesn't really make sense that they, that they wouldn't want to talk to each other too much in the way that we talk to neighboring nations and go visit them. Yes. The idea that they don't talk at all and that they don't expand at all to avoid conflict. I can't see that one happening. So essentially there, you, you couldn't stop the scenario if it occurred, but at the same time, it may be so, it may be the case that the galaxy is just so vast that nobody needs to go to war with each other because there's no territory wars because civilizations just never expand enough to meet each other on that kind of a level, um, which is why we don't see a giant galaxy war going on. But my last question for you is what I find to be the most terrifying scenario of the Fermi Paradox, that there is a machine civilization and, you know, there's some, some, some astronomers within SETI say, you know, it's probably more likely that if we ever find something, it's going to be a transmission from a machine rather than a biological being. And we ourselves are moving towards, you know, some kind of existence of merging with our machines at least, if not eventually becoming them. But isn't it terrifying that there could be a machine civilization out there just simply watching? And like the Mass Effect Reapers, it 
occasionally just causes an extinction, and that's the solution. Do you think that's viable? Do you think that's possible that there could be no. something out there that's oh, well, not very nice? Yeah. It's something not nice, sure. Uh, there's a couple of problems with that, though, and they're separate in this case. Um, you can't have a machine civilization because a machine doesn't civilize, doesn't do anything. If we're just talking about something that doesn't have to be biological, that's not a good, you know, it's a false dichotomy. If I upload my brain tomorrow, assuming there's no weird magic in place that makes me no longer human or sane or lose my soul, if I can just upload my brain to a computer, uh, I'm still human. You know, and if it's a machine that thinks and does stuff and does art and creation and growth, it's a person. It's not a human, but it's a person, right? So that's not really a machine anymore. Oh, a human's a machine, in which case we could say we're already a machine civilization. But if we're taking the opinion of that, that that machine is in that, in that kind of context where it's it's not people, then how can I have a civilization? You know, um, now as to them being, you know, the, the guys sleeping, you know, Cthulhu style in the dark or mass repos of a mass effect repo style. The problem there is, is the one we were saying earlier. If, if you say, here's what they are, here's what their motivation is, you then have to ask, how do they go about pursuing that motivation? And if your motivation is to keep the galaxy clear of, of nasty biological life, then that's a lot more easily accomplished in the first place. You sweep through the place every 10 million or so years, which is quite a long time to go through a galaxy, but nothing on an astronomical timeline, so you could do that very easily. Every 10 million years you sweep through, and every time you find algae, you, you scorch it. It's that easy. Or you take those plants apart so nothing can ever evolve in them, and you build stuff out of it instead, right? And if you just, if it's one of those civilizations that's trying to wait it out till the end of time and stockpile the resources, then they should be stockpiling those resources. They shouldn't be letting stars form. They shouldn't be uh, letting plants form. They should be taking those all apart and storing those materials. So you have to ask, why, why are they popping up just to kill off intelligent civilizations? Because there's no way they missed us for four billion years. Um, they saw us when you know, the bacteria force formed or oxygen force formed the atmosphere. And there's no real reason I can think of why you go and kill off intelligent civilizations specifically. Is they like we we don't like to kill off ecologies for some reason unless they get intelligence. And even then, they should have seen us by now. We've been around for a million years as as something clearly detectable as intelligent. But um, if their goal is to keep the galaxy clear of such things. And they're not stupid, which is kind of implied by them being an ancient civilization. They ought to have that down to a T by now, and that would involve sending a probe down to check on each one of those plants and look for those signs of artificial fires or other techno signals they've detected in their many years of purging. And so we should not be around to to even notice that this is a problem. Right? Uh, our existence is the best proof that there's no hostile aliens out there. Uh, unless they just happen to coincidentally have evolved about the same time we did, and that's astronomically un improbable. You know? What a lovely Douglas Adams-style uh, solution to the Fermi Paradox, that the Milky Way is sort of like the Florida galaxy, where machine civilizations are sleeping Cthulhu-style, and it's just that everybody's asleep. <laughs> on that note, we are out of time. Isaac, as usual, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, John. If you're new to Event Horizon, hit subscribe. It's free, and we upload videos every Thursday, plus additional content.